Hi guys, Brendan from TAP. Um, so today I'm going to do a bit of an experiment regarding catch cans on diesels. So what I want to do is I want to prove whether we get any pressure build up in the crankcase by using a catch can. The vehicle that we're going to use today is this Mazda BT50 2.2 litre. Um, so it's the later model, this would be equivalent to your Ford Ranger PX2. Um, main reason we're using is it runs quite a bit of boost, um, so full load you're going to get about 22 psi, um, steady state cruising around about 15 psi. Now, catch cans in particular, um, you know, Australia seems to be the, the main country that's on board with it, and there hasn't been a, a lot of testing as such, you know, just regular workshop style fitting them onto four wheel drives that I've seen. Um, obviously, um, big companies like Mann and Hummel do a lot of testing to prove the flow rates of their, their catch cans themselves. But um, what I want to do is put it on here and, and some of these kits that we're getting, you know, make sure that when we're putting in all this pipe work, the elbows, you know, reduces and things like this, see if it does affect um, the way that these engines breathe. Um, there's a lot of guys with four-wheel drives, obviously, in Australia, a lot of forums. You put those two together and inevitably guys want to put a lot of stuff on their four-wheel drive. Now, as professionals, um, all we can do is, you know, try and take opinion out of it try and put a little bit of fact to it. So I'm going to get some tooling, we're going to hook it up to the car, we're going to do some um, steady before um, tests, then we're going to create a few scenarios right through from a perfectly installed catch can system and we'll see what else we can come up with, you know, maybe a bit of a restriction, uh, maybe if you were to install it with the, the pipes backwards going through the catch can the wrong way, a few things like that and we'll see what kind of results we get. So at the moment we've got our stock 2.2 BT50 um, the breather system on this so it uses um, a hose coming out of the tappet cover, runs along into the air intake down here. Very simple system. So while it's all stock, um, we'll go do some testing. So we're all set up ready to go. I just want to show you the setup I've got. So I've got my laptop and scope safely inside of the car and we've got some long test drive leads coming out. Um, they go through a nice little spot in the bonnet there that doesn't clamp onto them. So. Um, nice and free. Um, I've obviously got my negative reference on the, the battery for um, all channels that require that. And um, we've got three channels rolling. So first we said we're going to be using the WPS 500 um, pressure transducer. Got just a um, hose coming from it going to the dipstick. Um, nice and sealed in there. So I'm going to be wrapping that up in a rag and um, keeping it away from heat sources. It's my expensive component that I, I don't want rattling around in the engine bay and getting damaged. You need to make sure you're protecting your own equipment. So I just wanted to show you what it's going to be in before I wrap it up and protect it. Um, that's going to be on range one, um, sorry, range three, which is zero to five PSI. Um, I'm expecting to see something between zero to five PSI. And um, rather than the regular BNC2 banana lead that you get with Pico, um, they run just a, a regular BNC lead and BNC at the other end up at the scope. Um, channel two, which is uh, red, is gonna be our map sensor here. I'm just back probed into uh, the back of the map sensor. And channel three green is on our map sensor here. Now. This I'll show you, um, we're, we're going to have to change a setting in the scope so that we can get a nice reading on that um, as it is a digital sensor, so it's reading a frequency. So I'll go and show you um, how we've got that set up. Now the main thing to keep in mind is I'm going to be keeping this um, set up on the Pico all the same throughout all the tests. Um, the only thing that's going to be changing will be you know, whether we fit a catch can, whether we create a restriction and all those kinds of things. Okay, so we've seen how we're set up in the engine bay. So a few things I've got set up in the Pico software, quite a long time base, two seconds per division. So each of these squares, these divisions, two seconds, giving us 20 seconds total on screen here for each uh, page, each capture. So I'm hoping to just do one wide open throttle pull down the road and capture the entire event. Um, because of that, I've got my sample rate up reasonably high, two mega samples, giving us a um, quite reasonable for this test sample interval of 10 microseconds. So in between um, each dot that the Pico is drawing to make its graph, um, there's a 10 microseconds. So ample speed for what is quite a slow test that we're doing. Um, to be honest, we're just looking at peak values really. So I'm uh, quite confident I'm not going to miss any uh, data. Now, Channel A, we've set up saying that we've got a WPS 500 um, pressure transducer on range three, its lowest range, and I've told it that I still want to see up to the highest maximum in that range of zero to five PSI. Um, channel B, we've got our 
um, map sensor, which is our boost pressure sensor, if you like. Um, that should be reading between zero and five volts. It's just the um, car is just idling away at the moment, if you can't hear that. Um, and then channel C was on our MAF sensor, our airflow meter. Now you'll see that it just looks like a carpet of data at the moment. It's not not very useful. Um, that's a digital MAF sensor giving out a frequency. So if I pause this, choose my zoom tool, zoom in on it, um, you'll start to see, or oh, gone a bit much there, you'll start to see that what we've actually got there is a frequency. So that will um, shrink and expand as we're um, getting a higher or lower airflow reading, but much easier um, if I keep that running so you can see, and we'll get out of this zoom, much easier on the Pico to just go from DC coupling, um, not AC coupling, which doesn't get used too often, but it does have its um, its its uses um, because it can see a frequency on screen it's it's giving us an option of, of graphing by frequency so I can choose that and uh, we can see it's up the screen there uh, it's probably a bit high for what we want so let's go to a higher range we'll measure 0 to 20,000 Hertz and we can now see that it's graphing that frequency down here and at the moment it looks like it's at about 3,000 Hertz um, you'll notice when I go to these other channels, it doesn't give me that frequency because what it's seeing there, it doesn't really register that as a frequency. So if you're wondering why the option isn't there, and it, it is sometimes, uh, the software notices when there's a, a measurable frequency there. So um, I'll just go give the car a rev, just so at least you can see um, what we'll be looking for when we're out on the road. We've taken our first wide open throttle pull down the road now. So this is uh, the data I've collected. Now this is the car still stock. Um, so we're still using the factory standard breathing system. Now if we remember, channel A is our crankcase pressure. Uh, B is our manifold absolute pressure sensor. And C is our uh, mass airflow sensor. Main reason I've got the MAF and the MAP up there is I wanna make sure that I'm hitting a, at least very close to the exact same uh, airflow and boost numbers. Um, or else it's going to skew what kind of crankcase pressure we're building um, in that same sort of realm. So I made sure before I did this, warmed the car up, went for a good drive so that we're trying to keep as, um, as many um, normalities throughout the testing as we can. So um, we can see that I was at a standstill, I've then foot to the floor and uh, it being in auto, this was the first gear shift and then we had a nice period of second gear through for about five seconds or so till I get off the throttle. Um, I have filtered this a little bit. So um, you'll remember we had a few spikes coming off of the, the frequency of the MAF. Um, this was a little bit hashier on the MAP sensor. Um, still kept quite a bit of detail there. So slight filtering I've put on it just to make it easier on the eye. You can see, you know, we can still see these individual um, pulls of the cylinder and the way they're changing the pressure in the intake manifold through the MAP sensor there. And on the crankcase uh, pressure, using my pressure transducer through the dipstick, um, you can see these um, reasonably even pulls of each cylinder, oh, not pull, sorry, but the pressure that they're creating um, in the crankcase after each combustion. So some of you might have seen uh, me using this kind of method to try and pick out injector washers, particularly on diesels that, um, that might have failed. Um, we would be looking for a variance between the cylinders of each one of these being a um, pressure pulse going into the crankcase. So um, the other thing you might notice since we had the setup is I'm now in millibar on my pressure range here. Um, when you're in PSI on Pico and you go below one PSI, it starts to give you this um, really difficult, strange quantitative number with um, fact duration and stuff in it. We don't want that, so I've changed it to millibar. The way to do that if you want is tools, preferences, get a region and language, and by having it on metric, that's gonna put us in millibar, whereas in US, it's gonna have that range as PSI. So we're gonna use millibar because it's a bit easier. So really what we're looking at is here, um, we're about 36 millibar. I'm going to note that down. I'm going to um, go through and we'll do a few more tests and eventually I'll have it all um, put into an Excel spreadsheet that I'll make into a graph and we'll, we'll look at the results. So we've got a Provent 200 kit set up here now. So down on this bracket, um, it's a fairly tidy setup that they've got. This one's from Western Filters. Um, obviously your Provent 200 comes out. I mean, it's a, it's a long system, but that's just how this engine base set up comes over and probably our main restriction, I believe, is going to be from this elbow that, um, you know, it would have been difficult to get away from them using that. So no discredit to the Western Filters kit, but they have had to use an elbow. So the um, crankcase gases are coming out, traveling through that elbow, um, heading down to the 
the uh, catch can and then coming back out, we then need to run a whole length of hose until um, we get back to our, our main um, hose, which is using another elbow there. So a couple of restriction points in this one, but um, that's what we want for this test, to be honest. So um, that's great. So we'll go out and we'll do the same um, full load test um, with a catch can um, installed properly. So what we're gonna do with this one, so I'm gonna take a um, joiner and I'm gonna restrict this thing. So obviously as professionals, we would know that we don't wanna go below the hose diameter that's been used in the original system, um, which is around this size. I've got this joiner that I'm gonna run a length of hose um, that's reduced it down there. So this is simulating, you know, the guy that's done it at home, he had a bit of irrigation fittings lying around and he's, he's rigged up what he can. Um, let's see uh, what kind of pressure increase we get from that. I've essentially installed the catch can in reverse. So I've got the, you can see the arrow that is on the top there, very easy to see, but um, you know, mistakes do happen. So what I've got is it coming out of the tappet cover, going into the lower um, port there, which actually has an arrow um, facing away from it. And the upper one that we're looking at here, I've got it coming out going to the, uh, the fresh air intake. So essentially we're flowing the catch can in reverse now. So our last test here, this is with the catch can flowing in reverse and what a different graph we have. So I actually had to back out mid pull on this one. I, I didn't even get out of first gear or anywhere near the top of the, the rev range. because I just saw the pressure rising dramatically. So if you can see this number here, 168 millibar we got to of crankcase pressure. Um, that's well over two PSI in a different range. Um, so we built a huge amount of pressure there. Um, I didn't particularly want to pull the gearbox off and do a rear main seal because I think that's where we might have been heading if I was to continue driving uh, with this thing flowing in reverse. So I imagine um, there would be some kind of one-way valve um, inside these catch cans. Um, we'll take a look at that in a little bit, but um, let's take this result. We'll put it into our graph and uh, we'll see what we got. I've pulled up a couple of documents just after a quick Google. Um, this first one's talking about the ProVent range. Um, so if you are fitting catch cans, I mean, I would recommend these as one of the higher quality ones. Um, and this goes through their range and interesting to note, um, they've modeled the blow by that they would expect um, from specific power ratings of engines. Um, from the power rating, they, they know the math reading and from that they've modeled the blow by. So make sure, you know, if you are working on anything with you know most common rails are going to be over this power level here which you'd call somewhere around 100 kilowatts um that provent 100 just won't be up for the job and similarly if you're working on any high power engines um another document just to show you what this one looks like looks like it's talking about the provent 200 specifically um, gives you a little bit of a breakdown of it um, so note that it's got a safety valve built into the cover up there and then this is a pressure regulator on the side so you can have a bit of a read through that um, page four talks about the pressure regulator a bit more and page five gives you a spec for the uh, safety valve on the top um, 50 millibar, around about 0.7 of a PSI, which we were approaching um, when we had that slight restriction. Um, whereas when we were going reverse through it, we were well over that, well over one PSI. So I would say that um, when we were flowing the can in reverse, um, that pressure regulator, which will go up, this pressure regulator here. So we were, we should have air coming in this way going out and traveling out. Now, because we we're pushing in here, um, I'd say something that it didn't like was happening with this pressure regulator. Um, and essentially the gas probably was not even flowing into the can, hence the safety valve didn't open. So yes, we did have um, a lot of crankcase pressure back here, but it probably got to this point and was um, stopped and it was never able to travel into the can. So definitely something you want to be aware of. So that's the end of our testing here. Um, I hope that um, you enjoyed that and it gave you a bit of insight. Um, in summary, I would say that um, by fitting a, a quality catch can like this um, correctly, there was no real appreciable rise in um, crankcase pressure that I would suspect would cause a problem. Um, obviously, the installation of it um, needs to um, keep in mind any restrictions that we're putting in that hose work. And then um, something I wasn't expecting, but it was great to see, um, definitely don't want to be putting these things in reverse. So um, that, that certainly could lead us to um, oil leaks, oil seals blowing out, 
or probably even worse, um, if we create enough crankcase pressure and we're not able to drain the oil out of the turbo return, um, we could get oil build up in there, you know, coming out of the turbo seals themselves, engine run on turbo failure, um, could get messy. So definitely if, you, if you're chasing any kind of oil leak, turbo problem, anything like that, and you see a catch can fit, just be 100% sure that it's been fit correctly with no massive restrictions and definitely flowing the right way. Um, hope you enjoyed this one, guys, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.